Life for Sunday School. And I really, and let me, if I may, for a few seconds, put a plug in for Sunday School. That was really good. I really enjoy, um, you know, as you think about the Christian life and coming to church, there's a balance of preaching and teaching. And so uh, last um, hour during Sunday School is teaching time. G gather around a circle if you're not normally accustomed to coming. I encourage you to be a part of that. That was great to be able to uh, open God's Word and go through verse by verse in 2 Peter chapter 2 and uh, exposit those verses and uh, just, you know, uh, share ideas back and forth and testimonies and just different things happening there. And I enjoy that. We use a lot of that out in Eidsville and other places, just kind of circle around, open God's Word, and, and teach through a chapter verse by verse. And uh, it's a great way to get to know, learn, know and learn God's Word. And uh, like I said, there's got to be a time for teaching and then preaching. So that, that's what the Disciples Day, Christ did both of those. And so uh, this hour as the, uh, the worship service, and they, uh, typically uh, we think of it more of a preaching time than teaching time, although there's some, uh, I'm probably more of a teacher than preacher. So, uh, but anyhow, we'll be in uh, Matthew chapter 11 this morning. Matthew chapter 11, and uh, a week from now we'll be out in Tarum. And uh, a week from yesterday, uh, there'll be a team arriving uh, from Sydney, uh, a team of eight, uh, originally from America, uh, Pensacola Christian College in the state of Florida. And they've been here in this country for the last three weeks now, ministering in Melbourne, Adelaide, and Sydney. And so they'll be flying up to be with us in Brisbane a week from yesterday. And then we'll make our way out to uh, Tarum, our first church. And then we'll have a Word for the West outreach happening on uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday the next week. So if you would pray uh, for us about that, and I'm not sure if anybody here is, uh, I know Tass is coming out and being with us in Sherburg. We're going to hold a, a kids club there in Sherburg, an Aboriginal community. And so that will take place on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And anybody else would like to uh, come out and more information about that, come see myself. And uh, we, we think it's cold here. I'm sure it'll be even colder <laughs> out there so at night time. So we're going we're gonna to gather on a campfire on Saturday nights and uh, really gather real close and have a barbecue and a property out there. And then we'll meet together Sunday morning into room and then head from there to Idesville Baptist Church in Idesville, two and a half hour drive and Sunday afternoon and then have a service there. And then we, uh, we travel to uh, Wandai on Monday, week from tomorrow. Uh, about two and a half hours from there, and that will be our home base uh, launching area for the next couple of days as we letterbox Dolby and other towns out in that area. And so, again, if you want any more, more information about that or like to come along, please uh, see, uh, see myself about that. <coughs> Math, Gospel of Matthew chapter 11, and again, I just love how the Lord works. And uh, again, if you're here during Sunday school, is this thing on, by the way? Am I? Is it Okay. I see no lights or anything. There's no nothing going on here, but uh, if they say it's on. It's on. It's on. And uh, so we'll, uh, we we really again enjoy Sunday school time. It's it's neat how the Lord works um, in connecting the, the uh, <clears throat> ideas and thoughts uh, for this morning. And a few statements that were made during Sunday school about faith. And faith is obeying God and acting upon it. And that was a topic of conversation for a few minutes there during Sunday school. And, and this morning, we're going to touch on this subject here, um, the epic battle of faith and doubt. The epic battle of faith and doubt. And uh, before we read Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to read a few verses around in the, uh, the New Testament here. Um, and I have them all listed out for me, so uh, you probably won't be able to turn there uh, this quick. But a uh, very familiar verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says, Now faith is, we have the definition of faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I'm sure all of us have maybe heard that uh, verse read before, even preached on. Very, very, very familiar verse. And, uh, you know, and sometimes you may say in your life, well, I don't have a lot of faith. You say, well, you know, maybe it's because you, you have no hope. For you, if you have no hope, then you'll have no faith, because faith is a substance of things hoped for. I was out traveling out west this past week, and I saw a marquee on a church sign, and uh, it said, uh, what did it say again? It said, uh, hope uh, says God can, faith says God will. That's pretty good. I read that and said, that's pretty good. Hope says uh, God can, and faith says God, God will. And so, you know, understand that faith is a substance of things hoped for. And so in the Christian life, there's always going to be a battle for your faith. Because the devil's after your faith. He's not after your, your health. 
All right, he's not after your family. He's not after your finances. He's not after your job. He's after your faith. Because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. All right, so the Christian life begins by faith, and it's lived out by faith. Understand one day in heaven, all faith will cease. Faith will become sight in heaven. When we understand, we look at our Savior face to face, and we see him, and all faith will cease at that time. But while we're here on this earth, we live a life of faith. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. If the devil can destroy your faith, then you can no longer please God. If he can destroy your hope, then you'll no longer have faith in God. Because hope is the substance. All right, And we have, we have hope in Christ. We have hope and faith that Christ is coming back one day, really shortly, very soon. Know a verse in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. All right, again, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, the Christian life starts with faith. You say, well, I've heard a lot of preaching in my life and, and teaching, but it's not doing anything for me. Well, maybe it's because of an issue of your faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word of preach did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. All right, so when we read God's word, you have to, you have to believe what God says. Faith is no word for belief. We all believe in something. And we, we all, people, every person in this world has faith. They believe in something, whether it's themselves, whether it's a denomination, whether it's a church, whether it's Hollywood, whether whatever you fill the blank in and the the issue we have to tell people is the fact that yes you have faith you got to put put that faith in the right object place that faith in the right object give it back to the person who gave it to you to begin with and so your faith will always be under attack my faith and your faith will be always be under attack up until the, the time that christ comes back your faith will be under attack to, to, to doubt god's ability his credibility his care and the devil is going to try to establish a negative view and doubt God in your life. What, it started back in the Garden of Eden. What does the Bible say? The devil said, yea, hath God said. Did God really mean that? Placing doubt in Adam and Eve's heart and life. So your faith is always going to be under attack all the time, each and every day. So we think about what tools are used against our faith to try and establish doubt in our Christian life. So each and every day we're going to face this battle. As you get up. As you live your day, as you go about your business, and you, and you lay your head at the pillow at night, you know, you're going to be struggling, and you're, there's going to be a battle going on in your life each and every day, faith and doubt. It's an epic battle. So what tools are used? Now, we're going to spend some time this morning um, looking at these tools that the devil uses against us, and the answer, the application, and the thing for us this morning is going to be the same. All right, let me give you, I won't give it to you yet, but in a few minutes, the... Uh, it's a very simple solution, very simple. It's nothing new, but it's very simple. I think sometimes we tend to complicate the Christian life. I mean, Christian life is really basically simple. You simply obey God, what he says, have faith in him, and act upon it, like I said this morning. It's very simple, but the problem is we, we tend to complicate it. Our sin nature, our attitudes, and, and our demeanor, and everything about life tends to complicate the Christian life. But here, we're going to look at a couple things here and, and really diagnose the, um, the issue and, and see a couple... Um, a couple issues, a couple tools that the devil uses to establish doubt in our life. Now, the book of Matthew uh, focuses on the question, and this also was mentioned during Sunday school, about who is Jesus Christ, and it answers that, answers that question in particular, the first 10 chapters of Matthew. Are we understand um, Matthew uh, names Christ as the Son of God, God incarnate, the King, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of Israel, the Savior of the world. And from chapter 1 to chapter 10, it gives uh, testimony and witnesses of who, in fact, Jesus Christ is, was and is today. All right, we begin with a testimony of history in chapter 1. We see the genealogy and ancestry that points to Christ as Messiah. In chapter 2, we uh, see the testimony of fulfilled prophecy. In chapter 3 of Matthew, the testimony of the forerunner John the Baptist comes on the scene. In chapter 4, we had a testimony of the power of Jesus 
as he himself defeats the arch, arch enemy of God, Satan. In chapters 5 through 7, we had a testimony of his words, the truthfulness, the power, the authority of what he said, verifying his claim. In chapters 8 and 9, we see a testimony of his works, his healing, his casting out demons, raising the dead, forgiving of sin. Chapter 10, um, we see the testimony of his disciples, and he just finished instructing his disciples to go into all the world and, and to uh, preach the gospel of the kingdom and to give them warnings and so forth in chapter 10. And then chapter 11 and chapter 12, we read of reaction of those who have heard and seen the testimonies of Christ the Messiah. How do people react to that? And I love that because as you go out witnessing, giving out tracts and tell people about Jesus Christ, you understand people are going to react a certain way. All right. And uh, in chapter 11, and chapter 12 of Matthew, we have the various re responses to the witnesses, no, <clears throat> excuse me, the witnessing of the deity of Jesus Christ. We have, uh, we have criticism. People react with criticism. They react with indifference, react with rejection. They have amazement. They have blasphemy, fascination, and doubt. All those are contained within chapter 11, chapter 12 of Matthew. All right, and these are all negative responses, by the way. And uh, <clears throat> the end of chapter 11 and the chapter 12 both give us the correct response when we hear about the teaching, the preaching of Jesus Christ, and that response is faith. And that's the right response is faith. And so we have this here in chapter 11 and 12. And understand, as we think about doubts, and uh, I don't know if you're uh, any kind of student of the Bible, or you, understand, you read through the gospel, you understand, think it back in your mind as you, as you read through God's word, scan God's word, and particularly in the gospels, you see how many times the disciples themselves doubted what Christ was doing. You ever, you ever notice that? O oh, ye of little faith, how long will ye doubt? Disciples were with Christ for three and a half years, for 24 hours a day and they still had problems with doubts and doubt is particularly an issue with a believer you think about that it's almost like you know you have to believe in something to it to in order to uh, have this issue of doubt and so doubt is primarily an issue of the believer in the bible and so this morning I, I pray we're all believers this morning we have christ inside our heart and we place our faith and trust in jesus christ and you're you are going to face this issue of doubt the darts of doubt will head your way if they haven't already and you're going to doubt, Christ, what, what are you doing in my life? I trusted you for salvation, and, and I don't understand what's going on in my life right now. And these, these arrows of doubt are going to head your way. And don't, don't feel like you're isolated, because you're not. We all deal with doubts. All of us do. The disciples did. Constantly. In fact, let me read a verse quickly to you in Matthew 28. And uh, this, is, <laughs> this is the uh, encapsulates the whole uh, idea here of the disciples and what they saw. Matthew 28, 17. This is after the resurrection. It says, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Ah, oh, it's not true. No, that didn't happen. They doubted. They doubted the resurrection. All right. And, and that word doubt is, is peppered throughout the time the disciples spent with Christ. All right. They, they doubted. There in Luke 12, 29, he says, Seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. All right, so this is a problem for the disciples and a problem for us today, having doubts, questioning God. God, why are you doing this? Your, your faith in God will often wane, and it will become weak. Don't be overconfident in your faith with God. There's going to be times when you're going to have a mountain, you know, life is ebbs and flows, ups and downs. So you're going to be time when they're going to be, you're going to have strong faith in God. So, Lord, I, I know you've seen me through in the past. You'll do it again. That's great. But don't overestimate your faith because there's going to come time when that's going to be tested. All right? And doubt will rise up in your life, and it, it, it will happen to us. And what, what can we do? What can we do when that happens? Let's go ahead and read uh chapter 11 of Matthew, and uh, a, few, uh, a few verses here. Matthew chapter 11, as we think about the epic battle of faith and doubts. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 1. All right, it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples. I remember chapter 10, Christ spent all that time commanding, teaching his disciples what to do. He departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities, all right? Christ being... Uh, a prime example in all things, not only did he tell his disciples what to do, he did it himself. 
Uh, he went. He, he sent his disciples away. Christ himself went to teach and preach in the cities of Galilee. In verse number two, now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. All right, verse number two, we read of John the Baptist. And here's a fellow, if you know anything about John the Baptist, he was a... Uh, I don't know, how can you relate him to a modern-day uh, outdoorsman? Maybe like a Bear Grylls. If you're familiar with Bear Grylls, all right. That was that type of, that was John the Baptist. Out there just eating locusts and honey. In fact, in Mark chapter 1, I think it's in Mark chapter 1, gives us a description of John the Baptist. And, and, and if you're not familiar with him, let me give you a little bit of a mental picture of who this guy was. All right, he wasn't uh, a wimp by any uh, stretch of the imagination. He was an outdoor fella. Uh, he lived outdoors. He loved the outdoors. And uh, Mark chapter 1... <clears throat> yeah, in verse number three. Well, let's read the let's start at verse number one. That's just uh, opening a few verses there. Mark 1, 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. And John, all right, so here's, here's a bit of a, a physical description of John, was clothed in, with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins and he did eat locusts and wild honey and preached saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. So verse 6 there gives a bit of a description again. All right, camel's hair. Uh, he, had, he ate locusts and wild honey. All right, I love wild honey. I never tried locusts before. And I'm not sure I'm, I'm game to do that. All right. <laughs> I mean, I'm not much of a person to eat weird things. I like to play, you know, play pretty safe when it comes to food. I want to know what I'm eating. And so, uh, but here... Uh, John the Baptist, he's, he's an outdoorsman, all right? He, like Bear Grylls, he, he lived out there. He survived out there. He didn't have a home. He lived under the stars. That was him, all right? So we go back to Matthew chapter 11 and get a little bit of a picture of who John the Baptist is in our, in our passage here. <clears throat> and we see in verse number two, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? All right, you get a little picture of John the Baptist, who he was, and a tough guy, outdoorsman. And here's a fellow now that is experiencing some doubt in his Christian life. He spent about 18 months preaching the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. He was the forerunner of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And here's this fella that's out there that's now experiencing doubt. And what he's saying here, he's saying this, uh, should I continue to believe what I believe or should I believe something else? Uh, Lord, I believe that you're the Messiah. Am I wrong in believing that? That's what he was saying. Art thou he that should come? Or do we look for another? Lord, are you, are you the Messiah? I'm believing that, but uh, help my unbelief. So right now, John the Baptist is experiencing some doubt in his Christian life. In fact, get a little more description of John the Baptist here in verse number 8 of Matthew 11, verse 8. Notice what, uh, let's read verse 7. This is, this is our Savior, Jesus Christ, his description of John the Baptist. Notice what he said in verse number 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John. All right, he, Christ, this is what Christ said about John the Baptist. And I often think, what would Christ say about me? What would he say about you? This is what he said about John the Baptist. What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what, what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? <laughs> no. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. <laughs> He's mocking the aristocrats. All right, so look at guys. 
This guy is no wimp, all right? He, he didn't come with a soft voice. He came, he, he's a strong fellow. Verse number nine, but went, what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say it unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall be prepare thy way before thee. Verse 11, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born a woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Now what a description. God himself gave this man, John the Baptist, a description to all the people. There hasn't been born a man greater than John the Baptist. Well, let me think of this. Is, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very, you know, I'm pretty simple-minded, so I think about you know, John is greater. That means we're lesser. Is that right? So John has problems with doubt. Do you think it's plausible that we'll have problems with doubt too because we're lesser? We're, lesser, we're less than him? So John the Baptist here is, is in prison, and he's experiencing doubt. He's having problems with doubt. And like I mentioned, we will come across this in our own Christian life. The first thing I see this morning is this, and here are the tools that the devil uses to try to destroy our faith, try to destroy our trust, our belief in God. Number one is this, difficult circumstances. Difficult circumstances tend to make us doubt. Do they not? You read John the Baptist here, and, and uh, he, is, he himself is finding himself in a very difficult circumstance right now. Understand that John's in prison. The said that John had heard in the prison. He's in prison right now. Now understand, prison back in Bible days is nothing like today. There's no, you know, three square meals and exercise rooms and saunas and swimming pools. All right, this is a, this is a dungeon. In fact, do a little bit of study. Uh, John is about maybe uh, 13, 14 kilometers northwest of the tip of the, the northern part of the Dead Sea, out in the middle of the wilderness in an old Herodian palace called the Maccabees. He's way out in the middle of nowhere in a desert. All right, and he's down below in the dungeon, the very basement of that place. Now, we read John the Baptist and who he, who he was. He was an outdoorman. He was outside. He had no building. He had no house to go to. He, he, he lived in outside. Now think of the difficulty of, for John the Baptist as he was in that prison to be locked in a dungeon, no doubt infested with rodents and damp, I'm sure mold in there, just an awful place to be. And he's in prison. You say, why is he in prison? Basically, uh, uh, the king, Herod, went to uh, visit his brother in Rome and uh, give you a little bit of a nutshell there, what's, uh, what's taking place in Capsulate. And uh, the, uh, his brother went to Rome and uh, saw his brother's wife. He liked his brother's wife, brought her, brought her back with him, divorced his own wife, got married to his brother's wife. John the Baptist got wind of that. And so he basically got into uh, Herod's face and said, you can't do that, you're committing adultery. Got into Herod's face, pointed his finger in his priest to him and said, you can't be doing that. And so they, he had him thrown in prison. And he would have had him killed, but uh, Herod feared the people, knowing the people understood uh, John to be a prophet. And so, but he threw him in prison. So he, he's in a tough place right now. He's going through some difficult circumstances. So here's John the Baptist in prison. He's locked up in this room. He's going through a difficult circumstance. In fact, humanly speaking, the career of John the Baptist had ended in a disaster. You know the story. He had his head removed from his body. And so, uh, you know, it wasn't a very uh, pretty sight. And, and John was going through a difficult circumstance. So you see, doubt comes from our inability to deal with negative circumstances or trials. And this is what we start thinking. God, if you're the God of all comforts in the Christ that cares, why am I going through this? And I believe that these same thoughts were running through John the Baptist's mind. You know, he, he's having doubt right now. Art, art thou he? Now understand, he sent his disciples to go find Jesus. He's locked in prison. The Bible says that uh, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. All right, there were disciples of Jesus and disciples of John. Disciples of John were often on the outskirts and watching Jesus perform miracles, and then they would go back and tell John what was going on. And so here, John obviously uh, received visitors every so often, and he said, hey, guys, two, two fellows showed up. We don't know who they are, but they uh, showed up to see John and visit him in a prison. He said, guys, go find Jesus and ask him this. Uh, is, 
I want to believe he's the Messiah, but help my unbelief. Are, are you the right one? And so he's having a hard time dealing with negative, negative circumstances. And, and uh, the thought comes to our mind, isn't there a place of blessedness for such a faithful man as I have been? God, is this, is this what it's supposed to be like when you care and love us? May those thoughts have run through your mind. And, uh, and don't be ashamed. It happened to John the Baptist, the greater, the grace of all men. It'll happen to us. We go through negative circumstances and things that were out of our control. You know, if everything doesn't go the way it should go, we wonder if God loves us and fall easily into doubt. And once we start thinking that way, Satan simply gets behind it and starts shoving and pushing in our selfishness and our ignorance and failure to see the whole plan of God. And in our constant problem of getting tied down to this passing world, we doubt God. We doubt him. John doubted because of difficult circumstances. And we can understand that. He was in a difficult place. But he did the right thing with his doubts. All right, now here is the solution to every one of these tools that will come upon us. The devil uses against us. It's a very simple solution. What, what did John the Baptist do? What did he do? He couldn't physically go himself, but he sent to his disciples, to whom? To, to Jesus Christ. All right? He didn't, the Bible doesn't record anything about John the Baptist whinging to these guys, or, uh, you know, obviously there's no Facebook back then or any kind of social media, so there's no way to hop on or spread the rumors about doubts of, uh, of you know, you're having doubts of God, uh, about God in your life. He went back to the source. He went back to Jesus Christ. He sent two disciples back to Christ. All right, so he, he did the right thing. He went immediately to the Lord. And that's the answer to all these is go back to the Lord. Go back and pray to him and ask him, Lord, help my unbelief. And that's the place to go if you have doubt over these things in our life is to go to the Lord. And understand what... Uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again. Interesting word. Show John again those things which ye do hear and see. Yes, what Christ is saying, go tell John, yes, I do care for you, John. I do care for people. Look at what I'm doing. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk again. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor had the gospel preached to them. Yes, I do care. Sometimes we, we, we think God doesn't care. Why am I going through this? If God's a God of all comfort, why am I going through this? In fact, God does care. He does care. And those were the signs of the Messiah. And in fact, in verse number 6, it says, it's, here's a beatitude, all right? We're familiar with the beatitudes back in chapter 5. And blessed is he, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Interesting word, offended. It means to be tripped up, to be suspended in air. In fact, the same word, we get our word meteorite from, meteor, meteor. It means to be suspended in air. Don't be suspended in the air. Don't be tripped up with what I'm doing, John the Baptist. Don't be, don't, don't be trapped in that. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. It's a bless. You're taking away a blessing when you don't trust the Lord. You're taking away the blessing. Blessedness can come if you tr just trust me even in the midst of mystifying circumstances. Have faith in God. We, we say it a lot, but do we really live it, really mean it. Trust him. Trust him. Go back to the one who gave it to your faith to begin with. John went to the right source. He went to the right source. So negative circumstances can often lead us to this area of doubt. John, if you don't think I care about the people who are hurting, Take a look at the kind of people I touch. I do care, John. In fact, this is only a preview of the coming kingdom. He does care. He does care. The second thing is this. The second thing that causes doubt in our Christian life, the second tool the devil often uses is this, is ungodly influences. Ungodly influences. Now, notice what it says here in verse number 2, that John had heard the works of Christ, and this confused him. All right, he heard the, in prison the works of Christ. He heard about it. It confused him because the works of Christ, the things Christ was doing, did not parallel what the people thought the Messiah should do. 
All right, very, very key. All right, ungodly ideologies, ungodly influences. In fact, uh, turn to John chapter 6, Gospel of John. <clears throat> and here, here's the thinking of the day. All right, understand there's a great confusion going on. Christ came for a purpose, for a reason. And the people, the general thinking of his day, why Christ came did not really line up with why Christ really came. John chapter 6 and verse, a uh, very familiar passage here, um, the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, we're not going to read through that. You're familiar with that. But um, that's verse number 13. This is after the, the miracle took place. After 5,000 people were fed, therefore, verse 13, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remain over and above unto them that had eaten. All right, understand, understand, to eat is a human all right, necessity. We have to eat. All right, here shortly we'll start getting hungry. I'm already hungry, so I'm always hungry. So. <laughs> but we, you know, we have a necessity. We, we, we find it uh, very difficult to go very long without eating. All right, and, and so here uh, Christ performed a great miracle. He fed 5,000 people plus leftovers. All right, an awesome miracle took place. Phenomenal. All right, only God can do that. All right, verse 14. And now here's the thinking of the day. Here's what's going on. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. All right, so this is the guy. He just fed us. He fed 5,000 people. Here's the, here's the thinking of the day. All right, this man should be our king. But notice what Christ's response was to that. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Christ left. He ran. He left the crowd. Why? That's not the reason why he came. Did he, did he do? He did miracles. He fed people. He healed people. We read that. But that's not the thinking of the, the thinking of the day was this, the, the Christ came to do this. Here's, here's, our, here's our leader, here's our prophet, here's our king, because he fed us. No, that was incorrect thinking. All right, so the mentality of the day was that. Christ came to deliver us out of the bondage of the Romans, to set up his kingdom, and we'll be free, free welfare state, we'll have food. That's not why Christ came. But that was the thinking of the day. That was it. It was ungodly thinking, ungodly influence. And John had become a victim of, his, of the thinking of his day, saying, isn't it supposed to, to be this way? Was Jesus supposed to be walking around meek and lowly with not much going on that changed the environment? The wrongs were still wrong. The injustices were still there. The sin was everywhere. It just wasn't the way it was supposed to be. And he had become victimized by the thinking of the people around him. You're there in uh, chapter 6, turn to chapter 14. Here, here's a similar uh, insight of the thinking of the day. John chapter 14. <clears throat> and here is uh, Philip. All right, John 14. Very familiar with verse, uh, verse 1 and, and uh, verse number 6. Very familiar. Let's read verse number 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, but no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Now notice what Philip says, verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Philip, do you know who I am? Do, do you know who I am, Philip? He, hath, he that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest then show us the Father? All right, declaring his deity. Philip, don't you know who I am? I'm with you. How many times have I said it before? You know, I would have got a little bit frustrated. Christ didn't, you know, Christ didn't sin. You know, he was pure in everything he did. I'm not sure how he did it. You know, he's God. He can do it. You know, we can't do that. We, we get frustrated with people. All right? And, and here Christ said that. All right? Um, turn to chapter 10. Uh, a few pages to the left, chapter 10, verse 24. Another, another instance here. All right, 10, 24. Let's read verse 22. 
John chapter 10, verse 22. <clears throat> and it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and he believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. This is a couple years of Christ's ministry. And here the Jews are saying, If thou be the Christ, stop, Lord, stop messing around. Just tell us plainly who you are. I told you guys. I told you. All right? Here, that's the inside of the thinking of the day. They didn't understand who Jesus was. They thought he was somebody to help free them the Roman occupation, help free them, give them free food. It wasn't that. That's not why Christ came. So you see the inside mentality of, of the thinking of the day. And that mentality got into John's thinking. It was ungodly influence. Ungodly influence. They had all become victimized by what the people around them thought he should be. Thought he should be. We face the same cause for doubt today, do we not? We doubt because we're perplexed by the plan of God. I think the world imposes that on us. So we live among the world today. We operate in the world. We're not of the world, but we operate in the world. Have you ever heard, ever heard this question posed? Maybe by, even by, maybe, you know, some Christian friends or no doubt the worldly influence around us. If God is a God of love, why is the world so messed up? You ever hear that? I've heard that. If Christ loves everyone so much, why do children die and people starve or get diseases and there's war and death? If your God is so loving, why doesn't he make things right in the world? Why is there so much injustice? You ever hear those phrases? I've heard that before. Yes. If your God is so loving... Why is he sending people to hell? They say, well, we'll tell you what kind of Christ we want, and if yours fits, we'll believe. All right, and, and that's the mentality we face today. And we, we get this. We get this ungodly philosophy and pressure on us. And, you know, the answer we have is to send them to Christ. Send them to Christ. And we, we, we cannot become victimized by that or we begin to doubt. You, you, sometimes a doubt say, yeah, I don't know. You know we, don't, we don't have to answer these people. And we say, why doesn't God do something? If there is a God, why are there so many false religions? We touched on that this morning in Sunday school. If he wants everyone to love him, he's so powerful, why doesn't he wipe out the false religions so we'll all believe? When you start letting the world dictate to you what God is and to be and to do, you look at the Bible and wonder and be perplexed. So don't, that's, that's, we have to guard against that. Guard against the world telling you what Christ should be. All right, God's word reveals who he is. We're living in the age of the dispensation of grace. All right, it's called dispensing, dispensa dispensing of grace. It's not always gonna be this way. All right, dispensation of grace will end when Christ comes back. All right, understand the world does not know God or his plan. They don't know Christ or understand who he is. Again, the solution is to go to him, is to go to the Lord. What, you'll find, what will you find when you go? Well, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised up. And... Christ is saying, John, yeah, look, can't you see? I am the one who will make things right. I am reaching out to the poor, reversing disease and death. Can't you see it? So ungodly influence is there back in chapter 11. So John is, is going through a time of doubt in his life. And I got a few more things here. Matthew chapter 11. When John had heard in the prison the works of Christ. Number three is this. Not only ungodly influences will cause us to doubt, but thirdly, insufficient revelation. <clears throat> insufficient revelation. All right, his disciples had come back to John, they're in prison, said that they had seen this and seen that. All right, understand, John's in prison, he can't see what's going on, he hears it secondhand information. All right, he can't, he doesn't have the opportunity to have a first-hand look. 
<clears throat> all right, he didn't have the same opportunity as Peter said that he did. He was an eyewitness of his majesty. All right, he didn't have the opportunity as John did, the uh, Apostle John, to handle him with his hands, as he said in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. All right, and John the Baptist did not even have a more sure word of scripture as we have today. He didn't have a complete revelation. He didn't have a complete picture of what was going on. There's a lot missing, and he was getting some stuff second-handed. Okay, a lot of people, here's where it comes down to us today. A lot of people doubt because they just don't understand God's revelation. You have to know the facts. You have to know the facts, what's going on. And where do you get the facts? Read the truth from God's word. All right, you return to God's word, you return to the Lord. Again, the answer is going back to the Lord. In fact, turn to Luke chapter 24. And I see a, a bit of an account here in Luke chapter 24. <clears throat> Matthew, Mark, Gospel, Luke. <clears throat> this is chapter 24. Let God speak through his word. All right, and that will spell the end of doubts. Here in Luke chapter 24. I love this passage here. This is after the resurrection of Christ and... and uh, You know, we often resort to uh, preaching only the resurrection during Easter time, and it's, it's a shame. We need to, you know, uh, that's, that's the hope that we have. Christ conquered death for us, and it's a great thing. We, actually, every Sunday we celebrate that. In fact, when we meet on Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and, and we often, we think about the cross. We think about, and that, that's important, but a lot of songs about the cross, and we have the cross as an emblem to represent our church and all that, but it's the empty tomb, the empty tomb that, that, that just... Uh, it encapsulates everything. You got to have the empty. To Christ conquered death for us, and he he rose from the dead. And this had just happened there in Luke chapter twenty four and verse thirteen. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which is from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. I think it's uh, seventeen, eighteen kilometers away. So a little bit of a hike. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. Understand, it was a busy, busy day. A lot of things happened. Christ arose that day. And they talked together, or they, these two guys, they chatted together. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. So Christ was there with these two guys walking on the road to Emmaus, but they didn't know who he was. And he said unto them, verse 17, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? All right, so Christ... Basically saying, guys, what are you talking about? Do you, I, I love this because did, did Jesus Christ know what they're talking about? I think he knows everything. He's God. He knows what they're talking about. He said, guys, what are you talking about? Why are you so sad? What's going on? And one of them, whose name was Clephas, answered, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Uh, do you, haven't you heard? Are you a stranger around here? Do you know what's happened? This man named Jesus just arose from, from the dead. And, and uh, verse 19, and he said unto them, what things? <laughs> what are you guys talking? I love that. How Christ responds. What, we got, what things are we talking about? All right. And then they said unto him, well, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and worthy for God and all the people. And how the chief, and they go on to say what happened. And that how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been uh, he which should have redeemed Israel. Okay, once again, look at that's it right there, inside thinking. But we trusted that it had been he which had redeemed Israel. Yes, he did redeem Israel, but not the way you guys thought. All right, he redeemed Israel and the rest of the world. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, and which were early at the sepulcher, and when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it, even so as the woman had said, but him they saw not. I always wondered what Jesus was thinking when these guys were describing everything about him. They didn't know it was him. They were describing his life, which took place, and I would have had a, I would have had a smirk on my face. I couldn't, help. I couldn't handle it, you know, but Christ here, I mean, I wonder what he was thinking. Well, his, his response to all those happenings there in verse 25, Then he said unto them, O fools! And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter in his glory? 
And notice what he said, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Understand, the Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament, all right? It began, the Old Testament speaks and declares and prophesies and just uh, proclaims the name of Christ, all right? He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Understand, they don't know who he is yet. But Christ took the Bible, the Old Testament, the prophets, in, in, in the scriptures, and he began to explain to these fellows the missing information that they, that they didn't catch. All right, And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went. And I'm not sure how to describe I, I, you know. I'm not sure how to describe this, but if, if you're reading this account about somebody else other than Christ in the flesh, I would think this person being a bit cheeky. You know, Christ wasn't that, all right? And I don't mean to be disrespectful, but he was testing their hearts. And the Bible says here, and he made as though he would have gone further, all right? So he's playing with these guys. He's saying, what are you guys talking about? What things, you know, he, 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 they, wrote there, they arrived there in town and he... He kept walking like he was going further. But they constrained him and said, no, 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 abide with us. For it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. When they saw that, and their eyes were opened, that's a whole nother thought. Christ took, blessed, break, and gave. It's a pattern. You see that a lot in the Gospels, and it's a whole other sermon there. And their eyes were open, verse 31, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Once he was gone, they said one to another, did, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? The story goes on from there. But folks, we need to let God speak through his word as we face this issue of doubt in our life and we don't always understand what God's doing these guys heard the scriptures being taught to them preached to them it was burning inside their heart it was burning Lord when you're speaking to us did not our hearts burn within us and folks we have a burning to know God's word and to read it to meditate on it and apply it to our life. Again, as we think of this issue of doubt in our Christian life, what's the answer? What's the solution? Go to the Lord. Read His Word. There, we're not going to, you say, do you understand everything? We don't understand everything in God's Word. We don't understand everything. And we don't understand how a God could let things happen and let things go on the way they do in the world today. And get to the point where you don't want to watch the news anymore. You don't want to hear news anymore because everything is just so you know, negative and everything is, is, is going downhill so fast. But don't let that discourage you. Don't let that play, be a tool the devil can use to put doubt in your, in your heart in your Christian life. Go to the Lord. Go to his word. Saying, Lord, I need you. And, and, and the fourth place, the last one this morning, last one, we'll close. The fourth thing that will doubt, cause us to doubt is this <clears throat> unfulfilled expectations unfulfilled expectations as john the baptist said do we look for another are you the messiah lord why would he say that only because he hadn't fulfilled his expectations what does that mean when john preached about christ he said there comes one after me who is mightier than i read that in mark chapter one with unquenchable fire and what was his word that John the Baptist used all the time? <clears throat> Excuse me. Repent. Repent. Turn your ways. Turn from your ways. Repent to the Lord. That was the word that he used a lot. The Messiah is coming in holy judgment. That was his message. That's what he was always preaching. Repent. In other words, you better get your life right because the Messiah is coming. The implication was that if your life wasn't right, you'd be judged. He was preaching that the Messiah was coming to judge. He expected a Messiah to land with brass feet blazing in fire to come blasting evil things with divine thunderbolts. And here came Jesus with a little group of 12 totally inept characters meekly wandering around Galilee. All right, so understand what John was preaching and what he heard from the prison wasn't, again, matching up. 
It wasn't matching up. Unfulfilled expectations. John just couldn't figure it out. Jesus was on a mission of mercy, and John's was a message of judgment. And really, impatience can lead to doubt. When we expect divine intervention and it doesn't happen, and we expect God to do something, and God's quiet, he's silent. And that can cause doubt. Impatience. That's something we all deal with. Is not we are not very patient people. Not very patient. I'll read a verse to you in two Peter chapter three verse three. <clears throat> two Peter chapter three. In verse number three, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Where is he? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Unfulfilled expectations. I thought this was going to happen. I expected Christ to do this in this situation. I expected him to work in this way, but he didn't. And now I'm beginning to doubt. Lord, you said you'd never leave me nor forsake me. Why do I feel left alone right now? What's the answer? As John the Baptist did, go to the Lord in prayer, in his word. Say, Lord, help my unbelief. I'm having doubt right now. I'm having doubt what's, what's happening in, in my life. The words of our Lord answer the problems of doubt. If you doubt because of challenging or difficult circumstances, look at his works. They prove he cares for people in difficulty. If you doubt because of worldly influences, look at his works. He is in control and will show it fully one day. If you doubt because of insufficient revelation, again, look at his works, study them, read them, and see who Christ is. If you doubt because of unfulfilled expectation, look again, for these are the previews of what he will do in the kingdom. In fact, there is a kingdom of God today. It's not physical kingdom. It will be one day physical when Christ comes back. But, you know, there, there are uh, Christians around this world that make up a spiritual kingdom, that Christians and sisters, and sisters in Christ across this world that make up the kingdom of God. The best part of the story, I believe, is in Matthew chapter 14. We'll close with this. We'll turn back to Matthew chapter 14. <clears throat> and uh, again, we know the end of John the Baptist's life, and it wasn't a, uh, a welcoming thing. It wasn't, no doubt, what John had in mind. But in Matthew chapter 14, and this is the end of John the Baptist, and uh, I, you know, I think sometimes, in, in, before we read, I think sometimes in our Christian life, we, we have this expectation that because we are, you know, children of God, that everything should go as planned. And, uh, you know, just the fact that we are breathing this morning and sitting up is enough. We are blessed to be able to, to live. That's enough. None of us deserve anything. And uh, just to be able to arise one more day and to breathe God's air, to enjoy his creation is more than what we deserve. Matthew 14, we know the story here in verse 8. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John the Baptist's head and a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in prison. He never got out. He never got out. And his head was brought in in a charger and given to the damsel, and she brought it to her mother. Notice verse 12, And the disciples came and took up the body and buried it. 
And who's the first person they told? And went and told Jesus. Why do you think that is? The first person they told what happened. Because John the Baptist believed that he was the Messiah. He believed. And he taught his disciples how to believe, how to have faith. And they knew who was important to John. They knew. He hadn't given, he hadn't given up his faith. He had a weak faith. He had doubts what Christ was doing. They went, and told, they went and told Jesus, the first person. Because Jesus was important to John. And in life, as we face these things, you know, we... <laughs> great verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13... It says, if we believe not, if we lack faith, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. <laughs> no, when we, when we have doubts, when we lack of faith, yet he abideth faithful. Yeah, I'll, that's it's un, un, unreal. To know God is faithful no matter what. We're feeling our lack of faith, our doubts that we're having. He's faithful. You know what? Faith is the unavoidable byproduct of uncertainty. Faith is the unavoidable byproduct of uncertainty. We live in a very uncertain life, and we're going to believe in something. Let me encourage you this morning to, to have faith and belief in God, not only for salvation, but for Christian living. And these things that will come against us, these tools uh, that devil will send our way, the tools of difficult circumstances, unfulfilled expectations, ungodly influences, insufficient revelation, these things will come our way. Let's remain strong in the Lord. You know, I believe we're living in the last days, and I don't think we have much time left. And the uh, devil is running rampant across this world, causing havoc. And uh, let us not lose our trust in the Lord. And I think I may have read this verse last time, and, and uh, I promise I'll close with this one here. But uh, one of my uh, favorite verses, not my life verse, but one of my favorite verses in, in all the scripture here is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. And I may have read this before, but I'll read it again. Paul says this, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as a word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. All right, we want God's word to be effective in our hearts, in our life. Well, you have to believe what God says. Believe and act upon it. Which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That believe that those doesn't say that that doubts, but that believe. That believe. You know, we live in a world that we want to see results. We want to see things happen. We and our our, our eyes are constantly being bombarded by by things, you know, the internet and, and Facebook and all. That. We want to see things happen, and when we don't see things happen, we begin to doubt. But let me encourage you to strengthen your faith in the Lord. Go go to Him, like John the Baptist. Go go see Him. Go see the Lord. We can only help. You know, pastors. Um, uh, assistants and church uh, members and, and friends and all that and, and church family can only help so much. We can pray for you, encourage you, and stand there by you. But ultimately, your faith must be strengthened in the Lord, in Him. You must go to Him. Say, Lord, I need you. I need your help. I, I need your strengthening right now. I'm, I'm doubting. I'm doubting what's going on. I need to be strengthened by you. Shall we pray? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you for John the Baptist, Lord, and many countless others who have gone on before us that uh, even the disciples were with you physically, oh, Lord, and they doubted. Lord, we doubt. I doubt. We all do, Lord, and I pray you help us in those times of doubt as we, our faith is weakened. And Father, as these things are coming our way and we, we feel the pressure of the world, we feel the pressure of circumstances that are beyond our control. You know, we, we can't, we don't even know what to do, Lord. I pray, Father, that you help us as we cry out to you. And our hearts cry is to you, Lord, to strengthen, 
and to once again not be offended in what you're doing not be tripped up not be trapped in what you're doing but lord we look forward to the day when our faith will become sight and that uh we'll live in heaven with you for all eternity but lord up until that time i pray we would strengthen our faith through you we walk with you day by day and turn to you in those times that we need and lord even those times we don't need you most so we still turn to you lord because that's what happens in our in our fleshly cycle of life lord we we turn away when things are going well and we turn to when things are going bad lord but let us always turn to you in rain or sunshine and father we thank you for your word in jesus name i pray amen